Hi, Founder fans. Jason here. I am joined by Michael Troy of the American Revolution podcast, and today we're going to be talking about an anti-founder, so to speak, uh, Admiral Richard Howe, who oversaw most of the British Navy's part in the American Revolutionary War. Michael, thank you for coming back. Happy to be here. All right. Now, we've already discussed all of the commanders of the British Army in the war. We're not going to discuss all of the admirals who led the Navy, but Admiral Howe was a very specific character. So uh, maybe we start a little bit about some of the many wars he fought in before the Revolution. Uh, I guess we should bring up immediately he is brothers of the other Howe in leading the British military. Right. General William Howe and Admiral Richard Howe were brothers, um, and they, of course, were um, in command of their respective militaries during the uh, most fun time of the war, the 76-77 time period, which is probably the best known part of the war. Um, uh, Richard Howe was the older brother. Uh, he was uh, actually get in his 50, almost in his 50s, I guess, by the time of the war or about 50. Um, he was born in the 1720s. Uh, as you may recall, when we talked about Richard Howe, their father kind of ditched them. They were in England, and he went off to Barbados to become the governor there, and after a year or two died. So uh, at the age of uh, Richard, I think, was about 10 or 12 years old when his father died. Uh, he was kind of on his own. He was studying at Eton at the time, and and it's unclear exactly when, but around that time he went to sea uh, at the age of like 12 or 13 years old, I think. He was uh, working in the Merchant Marine, and then he joined the Navy at age 16. Um, there were actually four Howe brothers altogether. We might as well cover all of them while we're here. Uh, the oldest brother of the four was George Augustus Howe, and he also joined the Army. Uh, he inherited the father's title and lands. Uh, Richard was the second son, got nothing. William the third son got nothing, and Thomas the fourth son got nothing. Uh, so, yeah, um, William and Richard, of course, uh, R William joined the army, Richard joined the navy, and Thomas went to work for the East India Company and made a fortune. <laughs> so he him. just went in for the money. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Um, Richard started his career relatively early um, in, in his early teens. He was already an officer by age 16. I think he was lieutenant by age 18 and a captain by age 20. So he rose fairly quickly through the ranks. Um, he was, got his start during the War of Austrian Succession, as most of our older generals do. He fought... He, 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 well, he was in the Navy, so he didn't really go to the continent. He was mostly in the waters around England. He did go up to the waters around Scotland for a time. He, he was part of putting down the Jacobite rebellion that was happening up there at the time, and he actually captured several French ships that were trying to bring arms and ammunition to the Scots. So that's where he got his start. That's where he cut his teeth. Interesting. Then he first comes to North America a little bit later to fight in the Seven Years' War. Yeah, Mo he did come to America um, before and during the Seven Years' War as part of his uh, naval efforts. He, he actually was pretty much all around the world before he was age 20. He went to Africa and he went to uh, South America and uh, they he had a mission to the Pacific, but that actually got scrubbed. Uh, they didn't make it all the way there. But he had seen a lot of the world by the time of the Seven Years' War. Um, most of his fighting during the Seven Years' War was again in the waters around England and off the coast of France. He, he captured a lot of French privateers and raided the coast of France, stuff like that. Um, of course, we're talking late 1750s, early 1760s by this time, so he's, he's in his 30s, kind of in his prime. Um, gets elected to parliament in 1757 as many top officers do uh, so he was in the house of commons and um, he would actually hold that seat until the end of the revolution for about 25 years uh, he uh, 
got appointed to the uh, as a uh, rear admiral. I always, I always get my my naval ranks messed up, but he, he was a rear admiral at that uh, time as well. So um, you know, he was definitely moving up in in uh, society, British society, I guess. Anyway, you know, as I said before, the house came from a very good family. Their father was a viscount. Their mother was the um, illegitimate niece of King George the First. Oh, so uh, yeah, they... very interesting. Got a little royal ties there. They... Well, so so that's a great setup. So now we find him in the 1760s, uh, probably in his mid 40s or so, and uh, things are getting a little tense with the American colonies. Uh, now, do we know what Admirable ha Admirable Admiral? Howe's opinion was about the goings on in the colonies. Did he think that Parliament, which he was a part of, was being a little too harsh? Did he think the colonies should just shut up and take it? <laughs> How was he feeling? Well, as I said, he, yeah, he was a member of Parliament, and um, uh, just for clarification, he he was a, a Viscount after his older brother George died in 1758. He did inherit the family and titles, but he was still in the House of Commons because. His peerage was in Ireland, and only peers from England and Scotland got to sit in the House of Lords. Oh. So he was a member of the House of Commons still, even when he was Lord Howe or Viscount Howe or however they wanted to call him. Um, but he was he was a very outspoken Whig. Uh, the Whigs were the people who really felt strongly about uh, English liberties and the rights of Englishmen and, and were very forward-thinking and Enlightenment-type people. He was one of those people, and he very strongly backed the colonists and the colonial cause. He thought that Britain was going way too far in trying to trample on, on the rights of the colonists. Uh, it probably um, pushed him in that direction, the fact that in the early 1770s, he became good friends or, or, or reasonably well acquainted and had lots of long conversations with the um, uh, representative of the colonists in London at the time, a guy named Benjamin Franklin. Um, so they got to know each other pretty well. Franklin was actually, uh, and this shouldn't surprise anyone, closer friends with his sister uh, because he liked the ladies and her husband died in 1769. So in this early 1770s, Franklin and Caroline Howe got to be really good friends and uh, Richard got to know uh, ben Franklin through Caroline, his sister. And they talked a lot about the colonial cause and what was happening in America and the denial of rights. And, and the two men were pretty simpatico on that. They, they really, Richard Howe really sympathized with what the colonists were going through and wanted to do what he could to help them. Right. Well, it's a nice side, side note there. We always think of Ben Franklin having fun when he's in France, but it's good to know he was having fun for his two decades or so in London also. <laughs> oh, he has fun everywhere. Come on, he had a legitimate, illegitimate son when he was still living in America. That's true. That's true. A very important one. Uh, very interesting. So as yeah. for Admiral Howe, uh, now that we've established his background, he is a company man, so to speak. So once the war breaks out, or... Uh, I should say as violence is breaking out because they don't really know. There's a little bit of crossing between Lexington and Concord and the generals, as we had said before, um, his brother is sent without knowing war had already essentially started. <laughs> um, but Richard shows up. Right, his bro yeah, his bro Sorry, I was going to say his brother went over in 1775 and, as you say, was shipped before they even heard about Lexington and Concord. Richard was still in london for that time he didn't go over until 1776 okay so they chose okay great so they chose these two brothers to work together i, I think we did discuss this last time <clears throat> thinking that well since the navy and the army never seem to get along but these guys are brothers they should work it out uh I, so richard uh, i'm sorry william had already been sent and they and then they decided hey why don't we choose richard or do we know if richard's rank was I don't know a lot about military ranks in 17th, 18th century Britain, I'll be honest with you, in the Navy. So, well, he, he, was, not, he was not the highest ranking officer around by, by far, uh, but service in America was not 
considered a particularly prestigious position. A lot of officers really didn't want to go serve there. They, they didn't like what was happening to the colonists. It was kind of out of the way. It wasn't a really valuable um, post where you'd make a lot of money. It wasn't a prestigious post where you'd be around, you know, other great powers of Europe or something like that. It was kind of, you know, off in the wilderness a bit. So th they didn't really send their best and brightest over to America. Um, the admiral who was in command before um, uh, Admiral Howe was uh, Samuel Graves, who had a reputation for trying to make as much money as he possibly could. And he was constantly screwing people over to make money. Uh, he was in Boston during the Siege of Boston in 1775, and the British soldiers were starving to death. And he charged soldiers a $1 a day fee to go fishing in Boston Harbor to feed themselves. So that was, you know, the kind of grasping he was. And of course, uh, General William Howe was not happy about that. The two men hated each other, had lots of fights, and were constantly complaining that they wouldn't cooperate with each other. The Navy wasn't supporting the Army. The Army wasn't supporting the Navy. And London got sick of this and said, all right, well, let's put an end to this fighting. We'll send his brother over. He's not going to complain about his brother, right? So that's where they picked Richard Howe to go over. And Richard did not want to go. He resisted, and he said no several times. Um, not not necessarily because it wasn't a prestigious position, but more because he opposed what the British were doing there. He, he didn't agree with it. Um, something I think we also touched on with William Howe, um, their older brother, George Howe, had died in the French and Indian War during an attack on Fort Caroline, which is later known as Fort Ticonderoga. Um, he died in the service in the defense of the colonies, and he had very good friends in the colonies. Um, um, George Howe died in the arms of a colonial major, a guy by the name of Israel Putnam, who you may have heard of at later times. Um, and Massachusetts set up a or paid for a huge memorial for George Howe in Westminster Abbey. And the the Howe brothers were really touched by this. They really felt a kinship with the colonists. And when the colonists were becoming attacked over taxes and having their colonial charters revoked and having all these punishments made on them, the Howes were really opposed to this. And Richard Howe especially was was very opposed and did not want to go be a part of um, suppressing and oppressing the uh, the colonists in America. Um, the only reason he agreed to go was he insisted that he be made a peace commissioner and that he be allowed to negotiate a fair and reasonable peace with the colonists. Uh, London did not want to let him do this, so they settled on a compromise, which was kind of enforced by the king, which was he could become a peace commissioner and go try to make peace, but he couldn't make a fair and equitable one. He could only, he couldn't make a single concession to the, to the rebels. All he could do was offer them pardons. And once they accepted the king's mercy unconditionally, then we could start talking about conditions. But as a peace commissioner, he was not allowed to do anything. And they also made his brother William Howe a co-commissioner and he wasn't allowed to do anything either. But those were the conditions they got, and that's that's where he went over. And he mostly went over not with the idea of crushing the colonists, but of seeing if he could talk down, talk across the table with some of these reasonable fellows, Benjamin Franklin among them at this point, and see if they could work out a reasonable compromise to kind of put this thing to an end without a lot of bloodshed. Yeah, talk them off the ledge, right? Come on, guys, don't do yeah. this. <laughs> So he does accept, right, and as you know, they. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was just. Uh, I was just going to say they, they. We've got a bit of delay it here. It sounds like it. This is the first time we've had a delay before. Well, go ahead. All you. I was just going to say they. He headed over with a really large fleet. Uh, this was the the shock and awe campaign of capturing New York City, which is what he went over for. He was bringing over large numbers of troops as well as ferrying down the existing British army from Halifax. 
Uh, they hit New York with about 50,000 men, about 40,000 soldiers, and about 10,000 sailors. Um, took the city with overwhelming force. Of course, we had the Battle of Long Island and a various series of battles in Manhattan to push the Americans out. And in the middle of all this, the Howe brothers kind of stop the battle and want to have a uh, meeting with uh, select members of Congress to discuss peace negotiations. And that's when they have the Staten Island Peace Conference that I think we've touched on in, in previous episodes. Right. Which, that's the one with, of uh, course, went John nowhere, Adams. but they, they tried their best. Yeah, that's the one with Adams yeah. and uh, uh, Franklin having the open, close the window discussion. And uh, what's it? I think it was Edward Rutledge was the third delegate from yeah. South Carolina. Yeah, so the, the delegates went up there and they basically said, you know, can't we just put all this behind us and go back to the way things were? And, and the members of Congress said, no, no, we can't. <laughs> you guys have been shooting and killing our people and, you know, we don't want to be a part of this anymore. They also got, unfortunately got there a few months after the Declaration of Independence had already been issued. And that was kind of the point of no return for a lot of the Americans. Once that got issued, they, there was no going back. Right, it had gone from rebellion to treason, and that's not great. Uh, so, uh, as the war progresses, uh, do we know how long does Admiral Howe stay in charge of naval forces in North America? Well, he's there for most of 1776, and then in 1777, he's still there, and that's when he uh, participates in the Philadelphia campaign, taking his brother's army down to the Chesapeake and bringing them up into Maryland and then drops them all off so they can march through Maryland, Delaware, and Pennsylvania on their way to getting to Philadelphia. And um, at that point, Hal um, sails back out of the Chesapeake Bay and starts to make his way up the Delaware River. Uh, General Hal captures Philadelphia, but the Delaware River proves a real problem for the Navy and Admiral Howe is really spending the rest of 1777 trying to clear the river and get up river so that he can actually supply the British army that's now in Philadelphia. And that's when we have the, uh, the capture of Fort Mifflin and Mercer and a few other forts along the, the Delaware River. So after all that happens, um, William Howe, General Howe, uh, submits his resignation in late 1777. It's accepted in early 1778, and he actually leaves in the summer of 1778 because it took months just to get an answer to a question back then. So a resignation process took half a year. Um, but Admiral Howe remained in, in America at that point. Uh, he had also submitted a resignation, but it wasn't accepted. Uh, he remained uh, through most of 1778, helped ferry the uh, British from Philadelphia back to New York under General Clinton when um, they had to retreat from the city. Uh, most of the troops, as you know, marched across New Jersey and they got involved in the Battle of Monmouth. But uh, large numbers of loyalists, uh, the women and children who usually traveled with the army, the injured, uh, flight risks, people who might be ready to desert the British Army were all put aboard ships and carried back to New York aboard the Navy. And so that's what Admiral Howe was doing during all that time. Um, later in 1777, um, Howe is in New York Harbor with very few ships. The British had taken back almost all of the Navy. And around that time, the French Navy shows up. And Howe is basically caught with his pants down. He's got like four or five ships in New York and he's facing this huge fleet of like 18 ships of the line plus a bunch of smaller ships from the French. And they're about to move in and take New York. And this is where the British catch a break for a change. Uh, the French decide that the sandbars in New York are too shallow and they can't count on being able to get their ships in and out of the uh, of New York Harbor properly, and they decide not to attack, and they sail off for Newport, Rhode Island at that point. So Hal dodges a bullet. Um, he's kind of at this point awaiting the arrival of a British relief fleet under um, Admiral Byron, 
uh, so they, uh, uh, some of those ships arrive and he takes them up to Newport to do battle with the French and uh, prevent them from recapturing Newport, which is what the French and the Americans were trying to do at that time. And he draws the French out into open sea. They're getting ready for a huge battle. And this is in, when is this? Like August, I think, of 1778, which of course is the middle of hurricane season. That's, how, that's what, what I was going to say. It's uh, about when hurricane season starts. <laughs> yeah. So a hurricane comes and the both fleets, the French and British fleets are badly damaged by the storm and scattered all over the ocean. And so the French say, well, screw this. We're not dealing with this anymore. And they, they sail for Boston where they put in for repairs. Uh, uh, Admiral Hall chases them up there, but he really can't get into all the port defenses around Boston with his fleet, which is pretty badly damaged. Uh, he does get most of Admiral Byron's reinforcements with him. So they secure Newport, they secure New York, and everything's pretty good. At this point, it's it's late in the fall of 1778, and Admiral House finally had enough, and this is when he leaves. Uh, he heads back to Europe, or to London. Um, he was supposed to leave Admiral Byron in charge, uh, but Byron, whose nickname is Foulweather Jack, uh, was constantly getting caught in storms and never being where he was supposed to be at the right time. So, um, uh, Admiral Howe leaves a different admiral, um, James Gambier, in charge of the fleet. And Gambier was only supposed to be in command for a few weeks, but he ended up being in command for quite some time, um, I think about a year, uh, because Byron ends up sailing for the West Indies to get involved in some battles with the French down there. So he never actually takes over the North American command, at least not for for quite a while well we should note that so at this but anyway point, that's the, the end uh, I, I, I'm sorry we got that delay uh, at this point uh it, once the french join the war it becomes a world war and world wars in the 18th century are mostly at sea i shouldn't say mostly at sea but all of a sudden the ships are needed worldwide so that's why admiral howard's running into shortages and now uh byron has a that's why it would explain why Byron would up and leave North America to go to the Caribbean for it's not for no reason. Oh, absolutely. The Caribbean islands were considered some of the key territories that the French and English were going to be fighting over. Um, and in fact, they did trade a couple of islands in 1778. Uh, the French seized uh, Dominica and the British seized St. Lucia. Uh, so, yeah, the, the fighting was big down there, and, and as we've discussed before, those were the really cash value colonies that really made a lot of money for the mother country, so that's what they cared about more than anything. Um, so, yeah, a lot of the uh, Navy and Army fighting moved to the Caribbean and a little bit to the southern colonies, but yeah, the Navy was critical to all that, not only for fighting the enemy navies, but for transporting troops to where they needed to be and transporting supplies because these islands did not have enough food to support armies. So everything had to be brought in to support the armies that were there. And the Navy, of course, had a critical role in all of that. But Admiral Howe did not because he was pretty much out of the fight by now. He, he's heading back to London and he's done. Okay, so we'll follow him back to London. But first, uh, for the rest of the war, can we just, uh, who takes, uh, as you said, uh, Gambier, how do you pronounce the light? I can never pronounce the gentleman's name. Uh, Gambier. -er. Yeah, James Gambier. James Gambier uh, followed Richard Howe. Then uh, Admiral Byron did take command for a few months in 1779. Uh, then we have uh, uh, Marriott Arthenot, uh, who was commander. Um, Sir Thomas Graves, I think, commanded through Yorktown. And then um, Admiral Robert Digby uh, did the last couple of years. Okay. So yeah. I think there were about eight admirals altogether. Yeah, he seemed to be replaced by several people. So uh, good. I just want to clarify that. Uh, and who who's actually in charge of the Navy when Yorktown happens? Like 1781. 
Is it Graves? I think that's Thomas Graves. Yeah. It's still Graves. Okay, cool. Just wanted to run through that. But let's follow uh, Mr. Howe back to Europe. He uh, returns. I guess his resignation is accepted this time, or he just no longer cares if his resignation is accepted. Yeah, he didn't return until he received notification in 1778 that he was, you know, had permission to return and all that. Uh, he went back because he was very frustrated and unhappy with the way the war was being prosecuted. He's never had enough troops. He never had enough ships. Um, the sailors that Britain was getting at the time was really scraping the bottom of the barrel, and they, 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 the sailors were not really up to the job of what they should be doing. So he was frustrated by a whole lot of things, and he was also going back to face a wave of criticism against him. Uh, he was part of the um, whole Philadelphia campaign, which ended up uh, distracting the British Army and leading to the capture of General Burgoyne at Saratoga in New York. Uh, and Parliament wanted answers to all that. And so the Howe brothers spent a good chunk of 1779 in parliamentary hearings discussing uh, all the problems that happened in 1777 and why things went so wrong. And so that's what Admiral Howe was doing for the next couple of years. Right, and General William Howe ends up even publishing, uh, uh, I don't want to call it a book, but a defense of their actions at the time. Yeah, he publishes a pamphlet that defends his uh, um, duties at the time. And it's, uh, the hearings are actually a great thing for historians because they really tell us a lot about what the British were doing. <laughs> in the early part of the war and why they did what they did. I mean, a lot of it's self-serving justifications for stuff, you know, like you'd hear from a defense lawyer, but it's still interesting uh, reading. Yeah, now as for um, how, I understand- But Admiral Howe- Yeah, I understand he had, um, this is far from the end of his career. That's correct. He does not take another naval position though for the remainder of the war. Um, he sits in, in the House of Commons in Parliament and um, basically attacks the North Ministry continuously. Uh, he is actually offered a couple of uh, pretty plum positions. Uh, he refuses to take them. His two requirements before he'll serve another um, position are that the first Lord of the Admiralty, Earl Sandwich, must go and the Secretary of State for North American Affairs, Lord Germain, must go. They, you know, did not like either of those men, was not happy with them, did not, would not serve under either of them again. So he sits out the remainder of the war because those guys were there until the end of the war. And, uh, well, not quite the very end, but after Yorktown, at least. Um, at that point, the North Ministry falls. Uh, we get a new prime minister in 1782. Um, Admiral Howe once again takes a position in the Navy as commander of the Channel Fleet, which is a very prestigious position. Excellent. And I understand he also becomes first Lord of the Admiralty. I'm not, in, as I said earlier, I don't know a lot about British naval rank, but I would assume first Lord of the Admiralty is a pretty high level rank. Yeah, that's pretty much the equivalent of Secretary of the Navy in America. It's a very high position where you essentially command the entire Navy. The Earl of Sandwich had been First Lord of the Admiralty, um, and and Admiral Howe replaces him um, as as First Lord of the Admiralty. Although he only holds that for a relatively uh, for a couple of years, um, and I think that was a little bit later uh, in, in 1782. Two, he um, mostly just took on the, the, the command of the Channel Fleet. Uh, he also received a, I'm going to get this word wrong, a Viscountcy. He became a Viscount in Great Britain, as opposed to being a Viscount in Ireland, which meant he moved from the House of Commons to the House of Lords at this time. I think it was, uh, I'm checking my notes here, but I think it was 1788 that he became First Lord of the Admiralty. 
Um, and that was right after he had done another big mission for the Navy. Um, uh, the British held Gibraltar, which is in, well, I say it's in southern Spain. <laughs> the British would say it's to the south of Spain, uh, but it was a very defensive area right on the Iberian, bottom of the Iberian Peninsula, which controlled entryway and access out of the Mediterranean Sea. So it was a very key position. And the British held that for several centuries, and they still hold it today, actually. Yeah. It's one of the most important waterways um, in the world. The Spanish really wanted Gibraltar back. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the Spanish really wanted that back. And that was one of the main reasons they went to war in the first place. And they had it under siege. And there was a combined French and Spanish fleet that outnumbered Admiral Howe's fleet. And he was still able to get a relief column in there and fight a battle. Uh, I wouldn't call it a victory, but he was heavily outnumbered and he didn't get his butt totally kicked. So it was considered a successful mission. And it was after that that he um, was um, given the uh, first Lord of the Admiralty. Yeah, excellent. And then he fights through several more engagements. Um, I believe there was something with the Spanish and then he actually fights in the Napoleonic Wars. I guess I should say the French Revolutionary yeah, he, Wars because he passes away kind of before Napoleon as Napoleon's turning it into the Napoleonic right. Wars. He's not, yeah, he's not, he never really goes up against Napoleon. Right. Um, in the 1790s, the French Revolution uh, goes to war with, Revol Revolutionary France goes to war with the rest of Europe, including Britain. And that's when we see a lot of admirals and generals from the American Revolution really getting new promotions and and as the armies are enlarging they're they're becoming bigger commanders so yeah um, um, Admiral Howell takes on a few more positions is promoted a few more levels within the Admiralty uh, he also receives an earldom like which I guess Earl is above Viscount um, so uh, he's now the uh, first Earl Howe and um, he goes to war against revolutionary France. Um, and uh, yeah, he actually, I think he does go to sea a few times at this time, despite his age and despite his great seniority, he's actually out with the fleet on a few occasions. Um, his last great act, if you want to call it, is um, there's a mutiny in the British Navy and several ships are taken over by the local sailors and Admiral Howe, uh, finally being the peace commissioner he always wanted to be, is able to go visit these ships and talk to the sailors and talk them down and negotiate a peaceful solution to the mutiny um, and, and bring the ships back under British control without a great loss of life. And for that, he was made a Knight of the Garter which is a great honor in 1797. Um, and at that point, that's pretty much the cap of his career. He, he lives in London, he's pretty much retired and he dies in 1799. Okay, very, well, there it is. That's a pretty thorough review of Admiral Richard Howe that we've just gone through. Uh, Michael, thank you so much for telling us the story of uh, this British leader, which we don't talk enough about here on Founder of the Day. Uh, I look forward to having you back soon because I understand we are going to start talking about American generals, which this audience might prefer a little bit. Yeah, we'll start working on the home team. Yeah, home, home team advantage. Absolutely. Well, Mike, you, Michael, thank you again for coming back. Uh, viewers, Michael Troy of the American Revolution podcast. If you haven't started listening to it, you absolutely should go back to the beginning and listen through. I, I have already gone back. I'm on my second run through, Michael, because <laughs> I really enjoy it that much. Um, Mike will be back, and I will be back with you with another founder tomorrow.